Meditate first upon this free and endowed precious human existence, so difficult to obtain and so easily destroyed. From this moment on, make it meaningful. Second, everything is impermanent, environments and their inhabitants. The life force of beings in particular is fragile as a bubble. The hour of death is uncertain, and when it arrives, we become nothing but corpses. Because the Dharma is the only help at that time, practice with diligence. Third, at the time of death, there is no freedom due to our former actions, karma. Therefore, abandon harmful deeds and devote the time always to virtuous action. Contemplating in this way, examine the mind stream daily. Fourth, among the places, friends, happiness, wealth, and so on, in cyclic existence, there is constant torment from the three types of suffering. It is like the feast presented by the executioner as he leads one to the execution ground. Having cut the shackles of attachment, accomplish enlightenment with diligence. In the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I go for refuge until the enlightenment is achieved. Through the merit of practicing generosity and so on, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I go for refuge until the enlightenment is achieved. Through the merit of practicing generosity and so on, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I go for refuge until the enlightenment is achieved. Through the merit of practicing generosity and so on, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they be inseparable from the supreme joy that is without suffering. May they abide in the great equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they be inseparable from the supreme joy that is without suffering. May they abide in the great equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they be inseparable from the supreme joy that is without suffering. May they abide in the great equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. We're going to do a three minute meditation.
And uh, so we're on to page uh, 47, I believe. Is that correct? Um, on, uh, let's see. Okay, we're, we're reading from uh, Moonbeams of Mahamudra here. Uh, Moonbeams of Mahamudra, the classic meditation manual by Tralad Kyagbogum. And I wrote uh, to read for April 20th um, or around that date. So uh, the ways of meditating on the two kinds of selflessness. Right. But before we read that, I just want to, for the benefit of anybody that's following this on YouTube, I just want to mention that we've already last week read um, uh, the establishing uh, the view of insight and uh, then we enumerated the methods of different schools, the re relevant methods of our system, and then the first part of the relevant methods of our system, number one was why we meditate on selflessness. And so this is part two. And what page? Uh, On page um, 47. 40, 47. And uh, Steve, we uh, agreed that we would do Medicine Buddha 115. And Sharon will do it. Skip, do yeah. you think because a couple folks weren't here last week, we could, we could start here at the relevant methods of our system? And the general meditation on selflessness. So, uh, you know, those couple of folks can kind of get the holistic sure. point. Sure. We, we can do that. Okay. So we're going to back up to page 45. And we're going to read the relevant methods of our system. Uh, do you want to begin, Sharon? Okay. Uh, the general meditation on selflessness why we meditate on selflessness. It is very important to understand what we mean by the notion of ego, what we mean by me and mine, and so on. Our primordial ignorance and our failure to examine and analyze things properly means that we automatically conceptualize something called self and selflessness, subject and object, me and mine. We thus fail to realize the insubstantiality of the self and of external objects. Chandra Kerte's commentary to the Katusataka says, the self is conceived by existing by itself without being dependent on anything else. To realize selflessness is therefore to realize the non-existence of the mental implication called self. Selflessness has two aspects, the selflessness of persons and the selflessness of material things. Dhamma Kirti says, the notion of self comes from believing there is something called me that is immutable, unchanging, and permanent. This mistaken notion of a permanent physical body and of a permanent material world gives rise to defilements and obscurations. The Mio Seal Bu says, all phenomenal elements that have characteristics are called dharmas. Consciousness is called the person. The self of persons consists of an innate consciousness that regards itself as an enduring, self-existing, substantial entity. It clings to the notion of I, me, and mine, <clears throat> and makes the psychophysical constituents, or skandhas, as a permanent entity. The self of phenomena is created by the mind grasping at external objects as self-sufficient, substantial realities, and clinging to them as unchanging and reliable. These two forms of self-engendered karma, mental obscurations, emotional defilement, and suffering, Sri Dharma Kirti says, as long as there is the notion self, the notion of others will arise. 
if we hang on to these two notions, we experience attachment and aversion. Once we become entangled in attachment and aversion, various mental afflictions start to manifest. The Ratnabali says, as long as we fixate on the skandhas, we will project the notion of self. We continually create fresh karma when this notion of self abides. If this karma process is perpetuated, we will never put an end to rebirth. It is important to contemplate the idea of selflessness because we will find it impossible to achieve liberation without it. Dharma Kirti says, if we do not purge ourselves of this mistaken notion, there will be no way we can discard the idea of self. The Katusak Taka says, if you realize selflessness and the insubstantiality of an object, all the seeds of your samsaric disposition will cease. The Madhya Maka Bhattara says, all our confusion and defilements come from having a wrong notion of the self. When a yogi realizes the notion of the self to be illusory, he is able to eradicate that misconception. By meditating on selflessness, we can reverse the mental processes that fixate on the psychophysical constituents. The locus of the, of the idea of self, other, me, and mine. When that reversal takes place, the samsaric dispositions set up by craving, clinging, and grasping become nullified and exhausted. We then achieve liberation from samsara. The, the mulam adhya mikarika says, when the idea of me and mine becomes pacified, the idea of self and selflessness automatically disappear. It also says, when we realize no self within, and no self-substantiality without, we overcome the duality of me and mine. All conditions that perpetuate samsaric existence cease. Karmic dispositions, emotional conflicts, and mental defilements also come to cease. Okay, I'll continue. Two, ways of meditating on two kinds of selflessness. Negating the self of the person, there can be no notion of a self. If such a self were to really exist, it must have come into existence either from itself, from something outside itself, from both, or from neither. According to Madhya Maka, view of the Ratnavali, to advocate the notion of a pure self is to be deluded about the reality of things. Since none of these options is possible, the notion of the self cannot be real. The Ratna Bali also says, um, and I think we should note that in this self we're talking about ego. Um, am I correct with that, Steve? When when Buddhists are referring to the self in this way, they're referring to ego, correct? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, the Ratnabali also says, the notion of the self has not arisen of its own accord from something outside or from both, nor has it arisen in the three times. We should put an end to this mistaken concept. For this self truly to exist, it must be either identical to the psychophysical constituents or completely separate from them. The Madhya Makakarika says, <laughs> sorry, I, <laughs> I want to say like Kukaracha. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if the psychophysical constituents are the self, then 
it too will not, will have to experience birth and death. If there were nothing apart from the psychophysical constituents, the notion of an eternal, immutable, and permanent self would be nullified. If the self were identified with the psychophysical constituents, it would come into being and go out of existence in the same way as the other constituents. If the self were completely identical with the psychophysical constituents, without an enduring nature of its own, it would be difficult to establish memory and responsibility because there would be no continuity. You would not be responsible for your past negative actions because you would now be somebody different. And there could be no notion of your experiencing the consequences of those actions. Many difficulties arise from this premise. The idea of a self that is completely separate from the psychophysical constituent is ref refuted in the following excerpt. The Madhyamaka Karika, quote, if the self were dissociated from the skandhas, it would have no determining characteristics and would therefore be nothing. It also says, if the self were a separate entity from the skandhas, it would be divested of all significance. It would have no integral determination because cognition would be impossible. The Madhyamaka Vatara says, we should automatically rely, realize that what we consider mine is just as insubstantial as what we call me. The Madhyaka Karika says, when there is no substantial self, how can there be a sub substantial other? The Madhya, Madhya Makabhatara says, when we, when we come to realize there is no substantial self, we realize that our actions also lack inherent existence. It is by understanding this nature of selflessness that a yogi becomes liberated. The Bhavana Krama says, the notion of the self is dependent upon the five skandhas, the 18 spheres and 12 sense faculties. Without these, we cannot make any sense of a self. The notion of a self as presented by certain non-Buddhist thinkers has no basis because it is said to be unchanging and immutable. The skandhas are composite phenomena and all are subject to change. We have to realize the idea of me and mine is based on a misconception. Okay, who wants to carry on here? Cindy, are you there available? Of, of phenomena. The basis for the creation of self are the following dharmas, the psychophysical constituents, the elements, and the sense faculties. We negate this notion of the self in the following way. As the Amadhya Makkha Karika says, nothing whatsoever arises from itself, nor from others, neither from both, nor without a cause. Nothing whatsoever comes into existence. We employ this method of fourfold reasoning to negate the notion of self. The reasoning states that if something were to arise of its own accord and from itself, cause and effect would be identical. It also says, if what gives rise to the effect and that effect are the same, the cause and the effect would be one entity. If that which exists comes from something other than itself, there could be no homogene homogeneity between cause and effect. Again, it says, insofar as something is other than its cause, there can be no difference between that cause and anything else that exists. If we see something arises from itself and from something else, the problems we have already encountered would again apply. As the, as, as the Madhya Maka Vatara says, if something comes into existence without a cause or independence upon something else, it cannot be substantiated. If we examine things properly, we will see that everything is devoid of self. Both subject 
and object are found to be without any substance, substance or essence when we examine them thoroughly. If they truly had substance, it would have, it would have to consist of either one or many entities. However, however, neither of these options can be found. The Dhammakirti says, by examining the things of this world, we find that they have no substance. They are completely devoid of any unitary or multiple nature. The Bodhicitta Vivarana says, if something called atoms existed, they could, be not, they could not be regarded as indivisible. Even they lack any inherent existence, being reducible to ever finer particles. In brief, nothing exists as a complete unity or in a complete state of diversity. Mistaken notions about self and external world arise because our karmic traces and dispositions have created deluded ways of thinking. It also says, due to the turbulent activities of our karmic traces and dispositions, we perceive substantial things. These notions are determined by mind itself. No external world exists independently of these determinations of mind. Even if phenomena arise as if they had a kind of inherent existence, that in itself is not proof that any such substantiality is actually there. A magician can conjure up images that have no reality. We perceive the world as if things had substance to them in much the same way. The Lankavatara says, stirred up by hidden defilements, the mind creates the appearance of an external world. However, that reality does not exist. To perceive external phenomenon as real is a complete distortion. The Samadhiraja Sutra says, a magician is able to produce the illusion of horses, elephants, chariots, and so on. Similarly, our perceptions of a world created validity, substantiality, and duration. To contemplate the insubstantiality of the phenomenal world, we need to think about it in a way that is currently foreign. The Bhavana Krama says, the phenomenal world consists of the five psychophysical constituents, the 12 sensory formations, the 18 spheres, and so on. Without mind, these things have no existence. They are dependent on consciousness. We should realize that even if something looks as if it has validity, immutability, and duration, it reveals its lack of substantiality when we look into its finer particles. Our innate and inveterate tendency to cling to things that in reality are insubstantial makes us mistake them for substantial entities. In the same way that we take dreams to be actual events when sleeping, we take what is ephemeral and intangible to be abiding and substantial when awake. All these things are manifestations of mind. They have no independent existence. Steve, do you want to go on? How we gain insight through this meditation. Yep. The above negation of the two forms of self, the self of persons and the self of the phenomenal world, should be used to eradicate our attachment to things. However, we should not take this to mean nothing exists at all from the ultimate point of view. The Madhyamika Karakitka says, the victorious ones expounded the teachings on emptiness to eradicate absolute views that things are empty of substance should not be seen as an absolute view. The Maha Ratna Kuta Sutra says, Buddha, Kashyapa, holding on to a notion of ego as great like Mount Sumeru is easy to understand easier to understand than hanging on to notions of emptiness as a concept. Why is this so? Because Kashyapa, to understand emptiness, you need to dismantle all absolute views. To establish emptiness as another absolute view defeats its whole purpose. The Bodhicitta Avatara says, to conceptualize things as unoriginated, non-existent, and completely lacking in self is an inferior form of meditation. That is not the way to meditate on emptiness. Atisha says, 
only through developing skillful means and sharpening our discriminating awareness can we attain enlightenment, not from meditating on lack of self alone. How then should we understand emptiness? Emptiness is understood by not, not falling into the extremes of eternalism and nihilism. We should realize that everything exists in an interrelated or interdependent manner. Things do not exist substantially, but this does not mean things do not exist at all. The phenomenal world does have independent existence. To say that something is empty is to say that something has no inherent existence. It is not a way of saying it has no existence at all. The Madhyamika Karika says, Nothing exists that is not a product of dependent phenomena, and all dependent phenomena are empty of substantiality. It also says, to say that something exists substantially is to fall into the view of eternalism. To say that nothing exists is to fall into the view of nihilism. The wise ones do not fall into the extremes of existence or non-existence. The commentary of the Satya Vadya Vivanga says, for that reason, it is not empty or non-empty. It is not affirmed or negated. It, is, it neither arises nor does not arise. This is the teaching of Buddha. The human mind has, an inveterate, has the inveterate tendencies to grasp after or hang on to certain concepts because it is filled with terror and anxiety when it has, to, when it has no concepts to cling to. It makes us feel better when we can cling to concepts such as existence and non-existence. That is the cause of our downfall. The Ratnavali says, the teachings on emptiness do not give us anything on which to cling. Ordinary beings want concepts they can concretize, especially in relation to existence and non-existence and thus they become distracted from reality. We should also apply this reasoning to the mind and not presume it has any more substantiality than the things of the world just because it determines our perceptions of that world. The mind is also empty of inherent existence. We can see the mind has no inherent existence because it is not something that can be grasped shown or perceived in any form or shape. If we try to analyze the mind, we will see that it cannot be discovered as any kind of entity. The way to realize emptiness is to understand that the phenomenal world is determined by mind, while that same mind is devoid of substantiality. The Lanka of Avatara says, external reality is neither existent nor non-existent. Even mind has no substantiality. The elimination of all views is how we realize emptiness. The Bodhicharya Avatara says, mind cannot be perceived by the senses or by itself to look for the mind as self-existing or not. It is like looking for a barren woman's son. It is an exercise in futility. It also says, when mind no longer perceives either composite or non-composite entities, there is no other reality. Clinging to imaginary essences resolves into the non-conceptual state. The first Bhavana Krama says, view all three planes of existence as being of mental origin. Because everything Thing is created by mind. If you analyze the mind, you are analyzing the essence of everything. When well, we analyze, why, why don't we interrupt and have uh, Carol finish this section? Okay. Go. go ahead, okay. Carol. 
When we analyze the nature of mind, we need to understand that even the mind is insubstantial. How can the mind be unreal when it is said to create the external world? Just as phenomenal things and the senses have no essence, so too is the mind without substantiality substantiality. The objects of the world have many manifestations, yet they are neither one nor many in their nature. The mind is also neither one entity nor multiple entities. The mind and the external world are ephemeral. If we examine the nature of mind with discriminating awareness, we will see that it has no external or internal reality. The mind cannot be found in the three times, past, present, or future. The thoughts and emotions that arise in the mind come from nowhere and abide nowhere. You may wonder what the nature of mind is, if it cannot be grasped or established in any way. The Ratnavali says, Buddha, Kashyapa, mind can't be discovered through analysis. The nature of mind can't be known. That which can't be grasped has no past, present, or future. This meditative method is superior to meditations that employ analysis and concepts. The Sutra Lama Kaura says, apart from mind, nothing exists. Even the mind does not exist. Meditators who understand the unreality of both can settle in emptiness without duality. Master Vasu Bandhus says, when we understand that we only perceive mental images, we realize the insubstantial nature of mind because there can be no internal reality without external reality. The realization of this is non-duality. This is the direct perception of ultimate reality. Carol, could I <laughs> interrupt here? Uh, because we wanted to do the Medicine Buddha. And, sure. Uh, and I do have uh, one gift for everyone first that I'd like to tell you about. Uh, yesterday, we had an uh, engagement with uh, Dr. Ashok Beatty, who's a Jungian analyst in Wisconsin, and he gave us a dream, and he explained to us that when somebody gives a dream, then it is a dream for everyone, and this dream involves the Dalai Lama, so I thought everyone here would be interested in it and his interpretation of it. Uh, if, if you don't mind. So here, here's his dream. It's eight lines long. And he had this dream yesterday morning. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, was visiting us at our home in Milwaukee. I was doing some chore for him on the computer. Later, he requested that he needs to rest in our guest room. I led him to the guest room. Then I tried to find a sticky note in my office to put a note on the door of the guest room, do not disturb. However, all the sticky notes had some scribbles on them and I could not put a notice. Later, my grandson Loki and my daughter Ami came for a visit, loud and exuberant in their greeting. I was excited to see them, but tried to shush them so as not to disturb our honored guest. Uh, that's the dream. Now here's the Here's his interpretation of it. <laughs> for me, there are several personal recommendations for me to pursue. And by the way, he was commenting during our session on an essay of his, which was about the connection of Hinduism to the Red Book. And he's obviously a Hindu, but in any case, this is what he said. For me, there are several personal recommendations for me to pursue. Firstly, even the spiritual dimension has gone online. The archetypal mentor, guru, guide, rishi, anchorite, his holiness, the Dalai Lama, is visiting each one of us like the whale from the deep spirit to guide us. Each one of us will meet their rishi, their soul guide, in some form and guise. Stay open to the divine visitor from your depths. Then once the Outer chores are completed. The spirit guide calls for sleep, dream, contemplation, and reflection on the meaning of the pandemic and our collective response. The individual, familial, community, national, and global response to this crisis 
is a sample of paradigm shifts which need to be sustained beyond the pandemic to invoke lasting reset of our values and priorities. The engagement with the personal must be balanced with attention to the sacred and the transcendent. My grandson, Loki, represents my connection with the hopeful, playful, and confident emergent self. Uh, this is the God image in Jungian psychology, not the ego. The emergent self in, midst, in the midst of the crisis, we should not be oblivious of new possibilities for a robust, resilient, compassionate, and just society. My daughter, Ami, represents my emergent animo, wise beyond her youth, activist, advocate for the underdog, and optimistic about the future. It is an invitation to me from my soul guide, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, to integrate these prescriptions into my life. This dream will be a living dream. I will continue to ponder it on for a very long time. And then he goes on, but I, I'm going to leave it at that. For He has a blog called pathtothesoul.com, pathtothesoul.com. And he publishes a, a reflection every day uh, based on a dream. But he, the point was that when you give a dream to someone else, then it becomes their dream as well. Let's have Sharon lead us in the Medicine Buddha. Compassion for all is equal. Simply hearing your name dispels the suffering of lower realms. Buddha of medicine, you who heal the sickness of the three poisons, light of lapis lazuli, to you I pay homage. Bhagavan, Tathagata, Arhat, complete and perfect Buddha, glorious conqueror, Buddha of medicine, sovereign of the light of lapis lazuli, to you I bow, to you I pay homage. To you I offer, in you I take refuge. Te ata om betgan se, betgan se, maha betgan se, radza samudga te soha. Te ata om betgan se, betgan se, maha betgan se, Raja Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bet Gunze Bet Gunze Maha Bet Gunze Raja Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bet Gunze Bet Gunze Maha Bet Gunze Raza Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bet Gunze Bet Gunze Maha Bet Gunze Raza Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bet Gunze Bet Gunze Maha Bet Gunze Raza Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bet Gunze Bet Gunze Maha Bet Gunze Raza Samud Gate Soha Thank you, Sharon. That was lovely. Should we discuss anything we read today? Surely. Any of you have any thoughts about it? I, I know that by thinking in terms of impermanence and that everything is a consequence of cause and effect and of, of, of uh, things kind of lining up to into existence because of consciousness and energy coming together, you know, to, to create it is one of the happiest things I ever discovered in my life <laughs> because I, I realized that 
that everything that that happened, even if it was painful, um, to a certain extent, was there for me to um, to understand that concept, and that perhaps things that came to me, however negative, might have been a consequence of some energy I created. <laughs> Something that something that I did karmically from some other time, either this life or some other time in another life, perhaps that whatever whatever does happen is a consequence of of something from from what you've created. And so uh, through studying with Rinpoche, I I I learned to really understand you know, what the nuns taught me as a little girl, that, um, that when you create um, negativity, and, and, and they would call it sin, when you, when you, uh, when you do that, you, uh, you know, you, you have to ask to be forgiven. And, and, then, uh, and then that energy changes. And then you can proceed with a more virtuous path after that. And then, um, and then whatever you give out that's more virtuous also affects others. And so uh, you're not just obeying the Ten Commandments, you're also providing something better in the world. And so, um, but to think, of, to think of everything as impermanent and even myself as impermanent was a great release because um, you know we 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 are in this precious human body. Uh, that's the first thing that we hear from Rinpoche. Uh, to be born into the precious human body is is a great gift because we have the mechanics of a physical body that can hold a physical mind. And then with that mind, we can use our energy that can be directed from this body and relate to the rest of the world with it. And then we create new karma while we relate. But it's just a beautiful, it's just a beautiful idea to know that, um, that even though, um, your your mind is not permanent the thoughts somehow keep going on and they play out in how they reverberate through space and time and then maybe how you've treated someone this lifetime will be that energy will be used hundreds of years from now you know, uh, through uh, maybe a reflection through uh, your DNA, uh, maybe reflect it through, uh, through uh, some other uh, way in space uh, in um, another, an alternate universe. I don't know. <laughs> but either way, whatever you're doing is of consequence. So, but Rinpoche would always say to be still, too. <laughs> it was really important. <laughs> which well, I, th I still struggle with. <laughs> so. I think it's very interesting to see really how shallow uh, physical knowledge, our, our phys knowledge of our physiology is and, and how na narrow physical ideas are as compared to, you know, these long developed Buddhist ideas because you know scientists can't tell you how how you think and they can't tell you what life is they can, you know they can define life with two or three characteristics but they can't tell you why there is life and and so it it really highlights how how shallow our real knowledge of the mind is and, and of mind and of course in in Buddhism we're talking about Rigpa which is uh, uh, you know the all <laughs> the one uh, and not and not this mind or one of your minds um, we're not talking about that <laughs>
but but from Rigpa, from the mind comes everything, really. And we have such a shallow idea of what it is. Um, but the Buddhists have definitely uh, pulled a lot of ideas about it together, a lot more than you can find in, in uh, the books of physics or other natural sciences. I was, I was going to say something. I wanted to share this example. Um, in my training as a cranial sacral therapist, um, one of our teachers uh, said that, um, that how we are born leaves an imprint on the body and that his mother had a very precipitous birth and she just shot out and he said he's kind of lived his life that way mm -hmm. and he said and i so i thought about my own experience and i was a preemie and my mother was in labor for over 36 hours and i thought oh my goodness my imprint was that that everything is difficult and it takes a long time <laughs> to happen. <laughs> so, so I went, I don't know if I want that imprint anymore. I don't know if I want that way of looking at the world, but that didn't come right away when he said that. I thought I, I just had, I just stored away that idea. And I was being treated by a, a um, chiropractor and he had his hands on me and he, and he did something and he said that he was working on removing something that was like five generations back. And I'm like, the skeptical part of me was saying, oh, yeah, sure, right. You know, that that could really happen. And then, and then it occurred to me, I put those two things together and I went, oh, my God, there it is. There's your thing about everything is difficult and it takes a really long time to do something. So this imprint has affected, you know, my life. And what was odd is I went home from that treatment and I was very skeptical about the guy and everything. But I wound up having this huge healing episode and I wound up crying and just you know spiking a little fever and having this whole little healing crisis but it, it's just so interesting how something as profound and as is uh, you know the, the, our entrance into the world and our exit from the world has such an imprint on us and I guess that's why we in Buddhism we we contemplate you know our death and think about wanting to be in a, in a place where we can transition into whatever it is next. Not that we'll be that same entity, but that, you know, that there's, you know, I just think of how people prepare, you know, for death that, that are, that are, that are whatever. But um, I, I just, this is a beautiful, um, I love this reading this and it really helps me to understand, um, you know, the insubstantiality of thoughts, but yet as humans, we cling to them, you know, and, uh, the importance of just letting things go and just be in that flow of life and you know know that it isn't all you know stories so anyway they're significant till they're not significant anymore you know and we can let go of them but that was just a funny aha moment for me so i wanted to share that mm -hmm. Any wisdom from Steve? Yeah, Steve, no. He doesn't, want to, <laughs> he doesn't want to share today. I've got nothing for him, sorry. <laughs> Not today. Not today. <laughs> I love your little light shining back there. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. It's my little candle on my uh, shrine. Yeah, I love it. It's beautiful. Should we do our dedication then? Sure. Yes, and you're, we're going to dedicate this to Barbara's mother. And both, are we doing it in both um, English once and then twice in, or, or, or no, this one we just do once, right? Or, I'm just asking if we're going to do it in, in Tibetan also. We do it once in English and once in Tibetan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to do it, Steve? I'd be happy to. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, through this merit, may I swiftly accomplish the realization of the Buddhas and their Bodhisattva errors. And may I bring each and every single living being to that perfect state as well. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish evermore and more. By this merit, may all beings attain omniscience and defeat the enemy of wrongdoing. May they be liberated from the ocean of existence, which is shaken by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, by the blessings of the Buddhas who have attained the three kayas and the unchanging truth of reality, as well as the unwavering aspirations of the Sangha, 
May all the aspiration and dedication prayers be fulfilled. Gewa di ni dur da seche gewa du duarni ro wa chi kyang alupa de sala bro par sho chang chu sem cho green po che ma ke panam ki gyur chi ke panyam pa me pa yang gone gondu pa war sho so nam di yi tam chit zig pan yin to ne ne pe dra nam pam je ne ki gana chi ba lab tru pa sid pe so le dro wa do war sho sang ye ku sun ye pe jen la dong Chon yi ming yur dem pe jin lab dam. Gen du mi che dum pe jin lab ki. Chi tar go wa mon lab dru par sho. Thank you, everybody. Tashi delay. Tashi delay. Be safe and well. Be safe, everyone. Peace.